Thank you, Gopal. Uh, these words were not required. Uh, in any case, uh, we'll uh, move on. Medical. Yeah. You see, uh, diabetic macrodema has been touched upon by uh, Mohan to some extent, but uh, I just uh, outline how I manage DME in this uh, confusing scenario of uh, so many agents available. Maculopathy is not one picture. At the outset, I must say this, there are myriads of presentation. You can have patient on dialysis with boggy retina, you can have minimal exudation, and you can have uh, parafoveal and extrafoveal exudation. But what is today relevant is patients are fed up. Fed up means they will come dots up, so many injections have been given at X center, so many are you are giving. So somehow they will sometimes bring this chart to you, dots up with an injection like that. This is another patient who you know taught me that uh, you see the importance of monitoring all these patients also. So today, DME diagnosis is not very difficult. There are a lot of classifications, but neuro classification based on OCT is pretty good. But we must remember that even in the OCT era, should not forget about FA or maybe Octa. We will not debate on that. In any case, you see both these in concurrence with the vision. So we, all the decisions of mine are based on vision, FA and OCT picture. I will not take any decision on DME management without having all these three things together. So this is the classification I was referring to, which I think most of us now follow in the classification of uh, diabetic retinopathy, and this is DME. Very, very simple classifications compared to what uh, when we were students, we used to teach about uh, CSME, center involved, not involved. So from the information available of vision, as well as FA and OCT, I try to classify these patients as tractional DME or non-tractional. And within tractional, it is either macular traction or extra macular traction. And within non-tractional, then we have, depending on extra foveal or leakage or, or, or within the fovea, we decide on pharmacotherapy or laser or sometimes combined also. So if it's a tractional DME, but there is no vision loss, that means the membranes or traction is extra macular, and, uh, you know, uh, Sopnesh was showing the examples of uh, distractional DME and VMPs. So my treatment is observation, especially if the vision is good, good and if this is the only eye. So with stable vision, extra macular traction has to be observed. This is one patient just trying to exemplify. This patient has a lot of traction, but most of the traction is laser to the disc. This was lasered long time back by me. Patient maintaining good vision, only eye, right eye left eye and right eye already lost because of diabetic eye surgery. So this patient we are observing, no need to hurry. And tractional DME with vision loss, especially the recent vision loss, that is macular DRD. You see, uh, although there is a sway between surgery and injection, some people may give a trial of injection like uh, I also gave in this patient. And this patient was fortunate, or I was fortunate in fact, PVD got induced and edema went back. However, this may not happen every time, and this is not usual case. And if there is a vision loss because of traction, whatever you have assessed clinically, then you do this MIVS surgery. And this surgery also has become relatively simpler with the advent of MIVS. You do this pore vitrectomy, and after that, put in tricot to you know help you assess this tractional area of the posterior hyaloid face and gradually increase suction. A lot of times uh, this is combined with the catheter surgery. And after catheter is done, then what I normally do is I do a fluid air exchange in this patient after a near complete vitrectomy. Put in trepan glue there to help identify the epiretal membrane. Now this is a very nicely stained epiretal membrane here. Then you take 25 gauge MBR blade and try to identify the edge of ERM. And this generally will come as a single sheet with the help of a card forceps or any end opening forceps you can take and peel away this epiretal membrane. And after that, you do try to take off this ILM also because 
taking of ILM means we have ensured that all the components and data to that also have been taken care of. But believe me, it is not a must that you uh, take out the ILM in patients of epileptic membrane surgery. So this was the patient I did ILM surgery. It came off very nicely. So I was tempted to make this uh, multi-layered uh, ILM flap here and then did the uh, airflow exchange and then came out of it. This was another patient who was operated, complex uh, TRD with macro traction. And fortunately, this was the uh, picture post-operatively traction well taken care of. Coming to the non-tractional, center in volume diabetic macroedema, host of agents are now available, anti-VEGF agents. We have innovative molecules, we have biosimilars, and we have steroids, we have lasers also. So we tend to use all of them judiciously, depending on the information provided by uh, these three things, vision, FA, and OCT, and the response to these things, uh, anti-VEGF agents. And after you are fed up of everything, Sometimes, sometimes you can consider vitrectomy even in non-tractional diabetic macroidea. So this is the data of eccentrics here showing that the largest volume of uh, studies have been done in DMA with the uh, Rani Musibab. So for me, for all practical purposes, there are a lot of decision-making points. And DP number one is, one is you also have decided to treat center involving non-tractional diabetic macroidea. Anti-VEGF is generally the first choice. And Rani Mizuha has the maximum number of studies. And choice between innovative and, and, uh, and uh, these biosimilars is not much. I leave it to the patient. And I just write Rani Mizuha, whatever patient brings, whether Lucentis, Eccentrics, or Rizuha, we do give it. And Neflibercept does not necessarily scores over, except in very poor patients. And that too for the first year, which was what lesson was told to us by protocol e study. The key question is, what happens if you see patient does not respond so well, because all patients may not respond as well to this uh, injections of anti-VEGF. Avastin, frankly speaking, wonderful drug, everything very good about bevacizumab, but since it is not available single use, and we had had issues of end of all across, so for, I, frankly speaking, have given up using Avastin, uh, while well, I know Avastin is the maximum used drug all across the globe, and 70% of US still uses Avastin. So this drug can be actually used, provided you have very sure compounding pharmacies who can do it for you. So as I said, non-tractional DME for me, it comes to anti-VEGFs and anti vegf primarily Rani Mizubab. I do consider switch very fast from anti-VEGFs to steroids and situations where uh, I do consider steroids are, and they switch, there's a lot of question, when, when should you switch? Should you switch from Lucentis to Aflibercept necessarily, or should you switch from, say, Bevacizumab to uh, Ranimizumab? What I do is if patient has had injections of Avastin, I may shift them to either of two drugs, that is Ranimizumab or, or, or uh, Ilia. But if patient is already taking Ranimizumab, I normally do not shift because the gap between them is not much. And I will shift to steroids. And you can use Ozudrex because of the longevity of action. You can also use Tamsilone. There are issues with Tamsilone about IOP, about floaters, and other things. So these are the situations where Ozudrex may be considered as a you know early switch. Like the people who don't respond to two or three injections coexistent comorbidities like recent MI stroke, pseudophagic is very low threshold, and especially in COVID era, again, as was being pointed out uh, previously, that we don't want patients to keep coming in again, again and again, Ozudex may be a preferred drug also. So in some situations, especially in pseudophagic, and the situation which I mentioned before, detectimized eyes, and these patients, and these biomarkers which tell us that it may be inflammatory phenomena, like a lot of uh, uh, hyperactive dots and a lot of uh, heart exudates and cerebral fluid. In such situation, my threshold is very, very low and I shift those very, very fast. Even in fakey guys, I don't hesitate to inject Ozudrex, especially as I said, uh, where cost issues are there or people are unable to come for frequent follow up. So, this was a study which actually uh, gave through a lot of light when to switch. So, this was a study done in LA 
by Praveen Dugal. And the result was that if you see this slide, if you keep injecting in the lower slide, uh, uh, lower graph, that people do this, this red line, patients are not improving after two injections. So in such patients, there should be an early shift to uh, uh, Ozudrex or, or steroids. So this is one of the patient who had uh, this Ozudrex and the response, uh, as you see, with one shot is pretty good. This was another patient. You see upper one is pre and lower one is post Ozudrex. One shot Ozudrex because this patient was eating my head because he had uh, received seven injections of anti elsewhere. Even if sometimes this may break, but the response still occurs. So this was an example of a fake DME where uh, after multiple uh, uh, anti vegefs I shifted to Ozudex and the response, this was the OCT, uh, wonderful response to Ozudex, even in fake uh, DME can occur. So this is decision making point number three. First was anti vegef second decision making point two was shifting, third was if still you are unlucky, your patient is unlucky, it's unresponsive, then what I tend to do is repeat metabolic parameters, try to raise hemoglobin for say from 9 to 11, it does make a difference. Uh, repeat FA, if you can see laserable leaks in the uh, macula, you should laser them. And if you see CNP areas in the periphery or, or near station, try to take care of these areas. And because laser is one treatment which can decrease the number of injections also because the load of anti uh, VEGF decreases. And sometimes the treatment may become finite also. Fourth decision making point is that still, although very rare, that if center involving non-tractional DME is step on, then sometimes vitectomy can be considered. You see, a lot of these patients may not improve in vision. Some patients do improve in vision even in non-tractional DME, but, but the OCD picture improves more than, more than the vision. And there are a lot of biomarkers which were emphasized before, and these are listed in this yellow box. That if there is an intact ellipsoid zone, and in case there is a, a you know SRF mode and subfoveal mucinous detachment and absence of HRF, these patients they tend to improve more than if these uh, biomarkers are absent, especially if there is a setting of good metabolic control. So these are the in summary to tell you about what I said, traction with vision loss, PPV, without vision loss observation, non-tractional pharmacotherapy with laser sometimes, and, uh, and sometimes combined treatment. Couple of words about glitter zones, because uh, you have to ask this history about glitter zones in step on DME and sleep apnea, because there have been recent studies where it has been shown an association between obstructive sleep apnea and DME in type 2 diabetic patients and the rate of obstructive sleep apnea observed was it nearly double in patients of DME. So this also you can uh, you know inquire from the patient and refer to patients who, who can manage this uh, sleep apnea. A few words about lipid lowering agents. I think uh, you see if the lipid profile is deranged, all of us tend to give statins and the choice of statin is shifted from atorvastatin to rosuvastatin primarily because this has more favorable effect on the diabetic control. Also, if the uh, you know uh, triglyceride levels are raised, then the drug of choice becomes phenofibrate plus rosuvastatin, and the dosage 10 milligram plus 160 of phenofibrate. Cataract surgery I will skip because this has been nicely covered by by Mohan Rajan. A lot of futuristic things. Last slide about this. A lot of new drugs are coming up. Dinesh mentioned about rosimab. I'm sure this is going to be tried in diabetic also. Farsimab is an angiopoietin uh, combination drug, which is again coming up and into phase three trial. Superocular, a lot of people, steroids have started injecting. So just to summarize, do not lose sight of the fact that it's a systemic disease. So control systemic factors. Unlike AMD, which Dinesh was saying, there's no urgency. And this was also mentioned previously about uh, DME. Management depends on combination of these three things, visual equity, FA, and OCT. And this is just the summary of what I've already said. So we have to make a very judicious choice between all these agents and not only keep injecting, injecting, and injecting. And this will help 
for the maximum visual potential and benefit for these patients. Thank you very much for your kind attention.